A woman on average will come into contact with 167 chemicals per day just from what they put on their skin. I just started researching and then one ingredient that literally blew my mind. So it's a highly toxic ingredient, but it's in every single product you use. All of a sudden I started to find myself being super passionate about getting to the bottom of what this industry really stands for and what we really are putting onto our bodies. Safety advocates are sounding the alarm about potential health risks and thousands of cosmetic ingredients. More breast cancer in women, more testicular cancer in men. But are the chemicals the cause is the million dollar question. Industry you've chosen is not an easy industry to get into. I've sacrificed a lot. I just want people to know that when they listen to my story in particular is that everything's possible as long as you the story didn't start so wonderfully, did it? No. I was just attacked on a night out and did what I needed to do to protect myself, but got arrested again that night. They were like, we're gonna sentence you to two years in prison. And I felt empty. That moment for me was like, Gladiators, welcome back. Today I have a very special guest, uh, my dear friend, Daniel Lees. Daniel interviewed me almost a year ago, I think, right? If you, uh, probably about six months. Yeah. Six months yeah, ago, it feels months. like it. Yeah, I and know, then, yeah. And then we packed so much, we had to do it again. Yeah. Part one, part two. Yeah. And uh, I felt there was some strong connection and Daniel was going through a uh, kind of change in his life. And now that change has happened, we want to share with the audience. Um, Extremely good looking guy, uh, extremely great gentleman, and uh, thank you for coming to the arena, Daniel. Well, thank you very much for all those compliments. I yeah, mean, I hate you. I, I Usually, I'm the one that's paying the compliments, and everyone's like, wow, that was a really nice introduction. So that's not my turn to say thank you for that amazing introduction. No, it's so. true. I was watching one of your, uh, uh, I think one of your promotional posts on yeah. social media. I'm not very good at yeah. whatever, stories or whatever, and I was like, Oh, he's a good looking mother. Oh my God, it's Daniel. So he's on Yeah, yeah. It's like, wow. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, but yeah, super happy. We're going to, we're going to get to that. So yeah. let's go to, well, we're sitting here in Dubai. Yeah. Uh, all our boxes are ticked, thank God. And, uh, but the story didn't start so wonderfully, did it? No. Um, I mean, you're from England. I'm from England, yeah. Where, where, where in England? Tell us a little bit about your background. I'm from a place called Northampton. Um, it's a really weird fact, but it's, if you look at a map of England, it's the most central part of England. Yeah, but all the distribution centres are in Northampton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yeah. door knocked every single industrial state in Northampton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, great central location. Um, uh, very close to Birmingham, very close to London. Um, so, yeah, good place. Not really much going on, a bit boring. But, um, but yeah, I'm the youngest of three. Uh, come from a working class family. Um, you know, I, I kind of hate it when people say to me, you know, oh, you're the youngest, you must have got spoiled. Because um, my parents always told me I was not in a bad way, but I wasn't meant to happen. You know, I was a I was, you were an accident. I was an accident. Yeah. yeah. Um, How does that make you feel when somebody tells you you're an, it's interesting, actually, saying you weren't planned? Do you think yeah. that marked something or did it inspire you to say? I don't. Do you know what? I don't know. I you mean, you weren't bothered. I, I come on to obviously like growing up and family life and stuff like that, but I've done a lot of therapy and I'm I'm, I'm quite self aware of of my own trait. But I don't know what it is. Maybe it is that, but there is something inside me that just doesn't want to settle for anything. And it's always like maybe sometimes it's not necessarily the best trait to have because when you've got a lot, you're always still wanting more. But then you know the times where I didn't have much, I was striving for more. So. Um, kind yeah. of served you yeah but then when you're striving more do, do are you still happy because you can strive and be happy or you could be miserable not really truly enjoy where you are because you're constantly striving to get more am i making yeah, sense 100 percent. does think. it take your happiness away that striving to one more um no Sometimes. it doesn't take it doesn't take my happiness away um i think what it like i'm just so driven like i just i just want to achieve uh, greatness and it's not just for myself but it's, it's it's mainly for the ability to to also help others you know like um I've, I've, I've realized later on in my life that i get so much more fulfillment through helping other people that i think that's another driver for me um am i happy yeah i'm happy with the life that i have i am very grateful for everything that i do have um but i feel like if i'm too happy with what i've got and i'm too content then it will stop me exactly it will it will make me relax and and you know i live a good life but 
you know, I could live a better life. And, and, you know, at the point right now, in my point of my life is I'm not able to do everything I want to do, which makes me want to, to carry on doing more, you know, you beat yourself up a lot. Uh, I am hard on myself. Yeah. Um, but then I think, but I, I look at that in a, in a positive light because, you know, like I'm always looking at ways to improve myself, whether that's waking up in the morning and training at 5am, uh, whether that's eating healthily because I want to be optimal, you know, like, so I think it serves, serves as a positive really, you know, and I think, you know, talking about, you know, you, you, you talk about gladiators a lot. Yeah. Like if, if we were just okay with being content, you know, back in those days, we yeah. get killed. Yeah. We're dead. You know, so I, I kind of see myself as like a hunter. You know, if you if you put me a thousand years ago, you know, I'm the one that's going out feeding the village um, and providing because that's, that's just who I am, you know. Externally, you don't look that way. You, you, you're so chilled and cool and relaxed, but there's something burning inside you. Do, you. do you surprise people with your drive and energy? Yeah, I mean, I, I from a young age, like I constantly had to prove myself because during school years, I, I just hated it really. School wasn't for me. And we spoke a lot about that a lot on our podcast that we did. Like, I think the education system needs to be scrapped, to be honest, because it doesn't serve a purpose. Um, and it didn't serve a purpose for me. And I just got, um, you know, basically was told that I wouldn't amount to anything really. You know, I went to school a few years ago now, Funnily enough, um, which is weird to say. So like back in the years when we, we, we were there, if you weren't like a, if you weren't book smart, then you weren't going to really amount to nothing. So, yeah. you know, and then that combined with kind of like a bit of neglect from from the family um, just really propelled me to just be like, no, you feel there was for... favoritism for your other siblings? No, not at all. Um, okay. we're, we're super close. Like my sister was here recently. Um, and like with my niece and, and we had such an amazing time and like my brother's like my best friend. Um, but neglect came from our parents because when I was about 12, 11, 12 years old, um, my, my mum divorced my dad, which to be honest with you was one of the best things she did because, you know, he was an angry man, like emotionally, physically, um and it was a difficult environment for us because you wouldn't know which tony you was going to get um but the worst part about it was i suppose in hindsight was she found somebody quite quick um and because she needed love and attention which she was neglected for 18 years she found her love through that of another man rather than that of her children mm -hmm. so we kind of just got forgotten about um so I think that also has like. Is she still with this man? The second yeah, yeah. So I, was, I, I love Paul like to pieces. I think, you know, as a grown man. It now, wasn't about him. Yeah, yeah. As a grown man, mm -hmm. you can look back and 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 I really appreciate like, mm -hmm. you know, if it wasn't for him, we'd probably have been in a in an even worse situation because mm -hmm. you he know took on he took on three kids. three kids. Yeah, he took on three kids, took on financial responsibilities. You know, so I, I thank him for that. I think um, what I did find difficult at the time was just the lack of love and attention I then got from, mm -hmm. from my mum, which, which I didn't, I didn't necessarily know too much about at that time. I think it was just later on when I started to see like certain behavioral traits and be like, why is this happening? You know, mm -hmm. um, have you spoken to her since? Yeah. yeah we, we still speak all the time um, about it. Yeah, yeah. It's not exactly the, the easiest conversations to have at times. Um, but you know, with me, what you see is what you get. And, did she accept it? Did she like realize? Or? I think so. I do think so. I mean, you know, she doesn't have a bad bone in her body. Like, mm -hmm. and you know, I think that makes it a lot easier to accept because she was just a young she girl. Well. Yeah. She meant well, she was just a young girl who was also quite lost in, in, and she followed, I think somebody else's path of what they wanted for her life, not what she wanted for her life. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I have everything in my life because of the way she treated me. You know, and it wasn't, when I say she treated me, it's not like she treated me badly. She loves me and she still loves me dearly to this day. Uh, I think I'm probably the favorite out of all three, to be honest now, but, um, but, um, we can always edit that part. <laughs> <out. laughs> My brother's gonna be like, oh, yeah. um, but no, um, but in a nutshell, as I said, I just became super self-aware when I was older 
and kind of learned how to just accept how how things went really and you know if 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 she'd have treated me any differently or things would have gone differently maybe i wouldn't be where yeah, i'm at yeah. today you know what maybe i wouldn't have that drive um you don't know sometimes it's a blessing or a curse exactly yeah, yeah. and you can never know because hindsight's a great thing yeah um but i just have to take it as a positive probably looking back now i'll I, it'll be very similar I, I i look back and i think maybe i didn't have a great oh i didn't have a great childhood mm. it could have been but that i get a bit bitter sometimes towards it that i i kind of missed out on my childhood yeah and um it hurts your children need to be children children need to be you don't have to grow up so fast yeah and that, i think that was i think that was what what i found really difficult emotionally and mentally is because up until that point of where she divorced my dad she she needed us do you know what i mean so like we were she was and you were filling a cup exactly and and it is what it is do you know what i mean like she she, she it, nothing happened in malice and sure Shit you know? happens in life, you know, and exactly that's the cards you were dealt with. Hundred percent. Uh, and do you stay close to your dad? I don't speak to my dad anymore. No, really. No. So no. he's still the same angry guy. Well, um, it's a weird one because when when the divorce happened, um, I felt more for my dad because even despite his anger outbursts, you know, when you're a kid, you just think your dad, your dad, your, your mum, your mum. Yeah. You know, they're like they're they're everything to you, and. Um, I kept really close to my dad, but he kind of led me down a bit of a wrong path, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think we became super close um, and it became like best friends. And I think again, cause he needed me, do you know what I mean? He needed me, like when, when he broke up from my mum, he was, you know, like I was his emotional support mm -hmm. because my sister was at university and they, and they quickly stopped talking because of the way he was. Mm -hmm. And my brother was doing whatever he wanted to, to do at that time. Yeah, you were um, the one left. And I was the one that was kind of around. Um, and, you know, I remember times where we would go around and he'd just be crying his eyes out and I'd just be sitting there just thinking, like, what can I do? Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I think when I look back at it and reflect... It wasn't you know, fair. I was just... I was just... I was so scared that he was going to do something bad that I just thought... If to I, himself. Exactly. So that if or I'm to mum, maybe, even. Yeah. Well, he wasn't... He was. He'd left the house at that point, okay. so... But I just thought to myself, if I'm there, then at least nothing will happen. And I kind of felt like I needed to be there for him. Mm -hmm. So it's like straight away, I'm like this 12, 13 year old boy that's like. You should be out there playing football, not yeah. giving a shit. And I've given up my weekends to go and be with him. And, mm. and it was know, depressing. And it was very depressing, you know. And then, you know, cut a long story short, fast forward to my 30th birthday. And and we'd had some issues anyway when, when I moved to Dubai because. You know, he just didn't make any effort. And it was almost like out of sight, out of mind. And and the little Danny inside me was thinking, well, I was there for this guy mm -hmm. when he was going through his toughest moment. Like, why is he Why is he not even bothering to see me? Why is he not even coming to, to stay with me? Mm -hmm. You know, I live in this amazing place and he's not been to see me. And I kept saying to him, like, listen, dad, like, you know, come on, make a bit more effort. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's only me ever messaging you or calling you. And then when I do call you, you just moan at me for half an hour about how shit your life is. So, and it just became so emotionally draining for me that eventually I was just like, enough's enough. And then my 30th birthday came around and I asked him to help out, like cook, cooking at the barbecue. Yes. Both sides of the family would be there. Yes. Um, and he just turned around and was like, I'm not fucking cooking for your mum's family. And I was like, but still, it's not it's my mum's you. family, it's, it's, it's my 30th birthday. Like everyone's coming because I've come back from Dubai. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I didn't expect Everybody's making an effort. Exactly. I can't just cook the barbecue and yeah. <laughs> let everyone It was such a there. little thing. It was such a, a little thing, but the message was. Yeah. And, and he turned around, he said, I'd rather go to work and earn money than do that. And I was just like, wow. I said, don't worry, come, don't come then. Don't bother. And he didn't come. And he didn't come. And we haven't spoke since. Wow. Yeah. And he still doesn't make the first call. Never. So, uh. I'm not going to say I'm sorry to hear that because you're the man that you are because of all the situations. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, I, I always, when I share my challenges, I don't say, don't feel sorry for me. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I guess you're the same, right? We're no victims, yeah. but we just didn't have a say and we use that energy. Now that led me to anger. Yeah. So God help, even now at my age, I still think I can beat the crap out of anyone, right? So no matter how trained they are and stuff, mm. this anger thing, you know, I'm nice, 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 then red. Okay. We were having a quick chat before the podcast started. Yeah. So tell me about your little violence <laughs> issues, challenges. Um, wow. I mean. Because again, yeah. somebody look at me, they never think I could 
get violent or beat yeah. somebody up because I'm just so relaxed. Yeah, probably the same for me. <laughs> you, yeah, exact nicest guy in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so when 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 obviously my mum met Paul, and obviously my dad, I was obviously still close to my dad, so obviously my dad was filling me with all these things that mum was doing and stuff like that. So one sided. Yeah. So naturally, I had a lot of anger towards her, and then obviously I met her now husband who they've been together for 20 odd years now but i was then starting to resent him because he was around the house mm -hmm. he was he was telling me what to do and i'm just like you're not my dad like what mm -hmm. are you, what are you talking about and then but then my mum was obviously like like anyone yeah it's like the new Demand, relationship did you demanding you to respect it yeah and, and new relationships it's like you're besotted by that person yeah i, I understand it do you know what i mean like i understand because i've been there and i was just rebelling so much to the point of where i was about I think I was about 15 or 16 and my mum kicked me out um, and I went to live with my um, my best friend who kindly put me up with his family but I was smoking weed regularly just to sleep and you know I was going out on the weekends and getting super drunk I mean I'd started drinking when I was about 13 mm -hmm. you know and it was just because my surroundings and the people escape. hung around but it was also escape as well because I felt so good when when I was drinking you know um and also having fun you know it was recreational at the same time um but the first moment came around was when um uh i was about 16 and my sister i went to meet my sister out on a night out and unfortunately she got sexually assaulted in front of me um this guy just came out of nowhere just grabbed her up against the wall started putting her, his hands in up yeah. her and and uh obviously naturally as her brother i lost lost my shit and you know put the guy in the hospital I, I, I remember the police reading out the report of like what I'd done to him and I'd like broken teeth, broken jaws, broken eye sockets. Like this guy was in a world of pain. Mm -hmm. um, Every was, right. Yeah. To be and it was just, it, as I said at the beginning, you know, mm -hmm. deep down inside of me, I'm a hunter and, you know, especially my brother and sister, like they're so close to me that I don't, I, I think even in this moment now, if I'd see it again, I would do exactly the same because, you know, you can't let people get away with these types of things. And um, that was the first moment where I was like, it, it was, it was, I'd realized that, you know, wow, like I've done something bad here. Um, but then had you though? That's, are you with me? Like I, I got incidents where somebody came and they, ended, they approached me. Yeah. They end up worse than yeah. I did at the end. And yeah. the police charged me because he was in a worse state than yeah. I was. Does that make sense? I mean, fortunately. But um, he triggered it all. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I think the problem was, is obviously I got arrested, mm -hmm. spent the night in a police cell. Yeah. Luckily, the guy who I'd been arrested by, I, I was doing martial arts with his son. So before he actually recorded the conversation of what had happened, he said, listen, if I was in your position, I'd do exactly the same thing. But... You know, I have to, I, I have to, yeah. I have to, to do this, but they obviously were quite favorable upon me and I ended up only getting a caution. Um, and thankfully that guy ended up going on the sex offenders list. Um, wow. yeah, he was older. Yeah. So he was older, mm -hmm. um, Polish guy and yeah, he went on the sex offenders list in the end. Um, but then I, I'd, I'd realized that something had like, I'd, I'd obviously had this within me, but I think because I'd got off of a caution, it hadn't really, it hadn't really sunk in yeah. that I was actually in a bit of trouble. But, and then the second time was, was when my brother got bottled in front of me. So again, naturally mm -hmm. just wanting to be that protector. Were you bigger than your brother then? Or not necessarily? I wasn't bigger than my brother. Like me and my brother, I mean, you know, people used to know us about the town for like oh, really? the scrap because we, you have each other's back. we just damage like, you know, it's like, but there's times where guys had started on us on a night out and we'd taken care of like five or six of them in front of all of our friends. And they're like, I did not know that you two could do that. But you it's, like it's, to like, take bro brothers. it's like with bro brotherly instincts. Yeah, so like, yeah. I love him so much that I could, I don't care if I'm getting kicked in the face on the floor, I'm still going to get back up and, and, and go for that, that person. Cause I love them the most. You guys still talk about those times when you meet? <laughs> not so much anymore. <laughs> um, just because it's, no, it's not nothing really, to be proud it's of. It's nothing to yeah. be proud of, yeah. Um, we just yeah, but again, you, take you, care you're business other. owners, you're professionals. And does he yeah. have kids now? He's, he's yeah, he's just, he's just had his first baby. So a little Emmy, she's three months old now. Congratulations. So she, thank you. She's an absolute joy. Um, but anyways, cut along. Second short, time, in, second he got time, bottled. He got bottled. You I took care of it. And then um, 
got arrested again um um and they were like basically you know you, you need to watch yourself for this and then the third time was um i was just attacked on a night out and you know did what i needed to do to protect myself but got arrested again that night and then um that was the one where it was like it was, it, it was serious yeah because the police even though the guy didn't want to press charges um the guy was uh adam uh the the police sorry the guy didn't want to press charges but the police were wanted to come, him come for me mm -hmm. so they were the ones that pressed the charges um i think it was called i think it was a fray i think i called a fray or something like that. So where basically i commit a crime and, and the police can actually press charges on me yes um and the worst thing was is they had it all on camera so oh, it was no. all there and they made me out to be this bad guy um but it needed to happen do you know what i mean i it needed, to the line and say it's got to stop it needed to happen for so many reasons because i went to court and they were like you're gonna go to prison if you don't show them that you're a different person so you need to somehow work on yourself and come back in i can't remember how long it got adjourned for but you need to basically show them because they were basically going to sentence me to two years in prison um and i uh i ended up going to seek um uh counseling uh i went to alcoholics anonymous because these things never happened you when i was sober 18 something like this 18. yeah i was about 18 years old um, you're 32 now right 34 34 yeah. okay. and i um you know i i had to do something about it but it i needed it because there was so much i can't i'm so sad now because the the lady who did the counseling for me she was a life change she's like it's almost like she was like sent from heaven mm -hmm. um she helped me so much and i remember i I'd, I'd, would go into these counseling sessions and i would just cry my eyes out she'd ask me some questions mm -hmm. and, and i'd just, I just cry and cry and cry and there was so much emotion inside of me um whether it was the family thing whether it was um other things just things that just built up that i'd held on to um, and it all came out and then, you know, I, I really showed them the true me and, and, and just like, it was just basically this, this, this kid inside of me that was hurting and needed, needed help, you know? Um, now I went back for the sentencing and I remember the night before I couldn't sleep because I was just like, I've ruined my life. Do you know what I mean? I, I thought it was almost been certain. there. You have no idea if you're going to come out again. Yeah. And, and, and the feeling of not having control of your life is, is very daunting. Yes. You know, um, at this point I was excelling in my career as a chef. Um, I'd studied for like three years and I'd, I'd always worked from like a young age from getting paper rounds, right? Food to get my first job when I was 14. So I kind of was like ruining my, life from a career aspect and from an overall aspect if you, you lost control of your social life control. exactly um and i remember standing there and i was i was upset i was crying you know i just explained to the, the the magistrates that i'm not who this person you see on that screen you know because they kept playing it back on the fight and stuff like that and mm -hmm. everyone saw it and that was also horrible <laughs> because you know my family saw I'm, I'm, i remember hearing my mum crying and stuff like that and, and my family saw all this anger that was inside me and it was like it was like this different person right mm -hmm. and um i remember they they're like right we're gonna we're gonna decide on the sentence and they they, they went back and they they turned the it. jury yes it was oh. a jury yes yeah. so they went back and they um um well no it was like a magistrate so there's three of them so they were like civil servants and yeah, they, yeah, yeah. They, they decide and so magistrates are not as bad as crown court and stuff so oh no yeah. yeah so they came back i could have told you you'd get away with it yeah magistrates <laughs> so, don't lock you up so so they came back and um they were like we're going to sentence you to two years in prison and then just silent and I, my heart just dropped and i just started crying i hear my mum crying hear my family crying suspended so. um and then they were like, but we're going to suspend it for two years. Wow. You're going to serve 250 hours community service. Oh, I've done that too. <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to do probation and yeah. stuff like that. And that moment for me was like, they gave yeah. me an opportunity. And he said to me, he said, we're going to give you this chance because the lady who was my counsellor basically had a word with him and said, this guy cannot go to prison. If you send him to prison, it's the Down worst place spiral. for him because he's just obviously dealt with, with some childhood trauma. And you just need to give him a chance. And the guy was like, I'm going to give you a chance because of this, because of, because of this. And I hope I ha never have to see your face again. But just so you know, if you do ever commit a crime, you'll serve the sentence for every single individual crime you've committed. Um, and there won't be, and you'll serve the full sentence. 
and that was enough for me. I, I left that and started doing probation, community service. Within, I think, four or five community service sessions, they turned around and was like, this guy doesn't need to be here. You're joking, I served mine. No, he was like, they don't, they, you don't need to you, be uh, here. You, you were, they were too nice, you're too charming, man. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> it's bringing half an hour. But I worked the so long, hard. La, the Do you know worst I mean? hour of my life, longest. I was just like, I just need Every to get this over and done with yeah. and just, and I'd grafted. And then it what got did to, you do? What did you do? So at first it was like community service where I had to go and cut bushes, clean up rubbish, did that. wash graffiti off the walls and stuff well, like that. I'll and put then, dry, is it the walls? The dry yeah, yeah. stone walls? And then, and then because I was so well behaved, mm -hmm. all the criminals that like were obviously going to commit crimes again, yes. they were like, you need to be away from this. So they moved us into this, like we went to go for private company. So warehousing jobs and stuff like that. Oh, you lucky son. And um, yeah, they were like, this this kid's good, you know. He doesn't need to be here anymore. Um, you know, we can say inside that. You are. Yeah, inside me off. No, yeah. nobody did that to me. I and, did the dry stone walls. Yeah, in freezing cold winter days, and then I'm sitting with criminals planning bank robbery. I'm like, this is not where I should be. Yeah, yeah. And then they recommended to run a community, a, a children's uh, community place. Yeah. And I, I was quite well off then, so I gave them loads of gym equipment. The kids love me, um, but then I served my last hour. Yeah, it was horrible, and um, but yeah, it was a turning point in my life because it was like mm -hmm. I got a second chance at life, and well, obviously I'd started to learn a lot about myself, and, and then I excelled from there really. Chef, uh, yeah, I got for a job, how long? Got a job in a Michelin star restaurant, um, working for Gary Rhodes. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. So I, I did summer travels and um, went to work in Greece through the summers. And what was it like working for Gary? Because I I knew him. We were neighbours at Grosvenor House. Oh, nice. Yeah, I mean, we never really had too much interaction. Okay, do you learn anything from him? Uh, no, because he was never in the kitchen. And mm -hmm. I was like slave labor rather than somebody, that, you know, there was a high burn rate in the kitchen. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't stay there for long, to be honest, because I, I saw that, like, I'd always wanted to be the best at what I did, no matter what. And you I weren't going to shine. And I, I, and I couldn't survive. Like, I was earning 12,500 pounds a year. So if mm -hmm. we put that into UAE money, that's 55,000 dirhams. A year, yeah. a year, yeah. sixty thousand maybe. And you get but, taxed maybe a little bit, but. Well, and then I was living in central London, so I was paying rent and paying to get to work. If it wasn't for the fact that I was a chef, I wouldn't have been able to eat, you yes. know. Yeah. And I remember going back to see my mum um, at this point, and um, I was crying my eyes out, like just exhaustion. I was working twenty-hour days, not really thriving at life, mm -hmm. and I'd lost so much weight because I wasn't eating. And and. And working. kitchens those days weren't inspiring places, were they? Nah. Yeah, there, lots of abuse went on in kitchens. Silence, mate. Yeah. Silence, yeah. For, unless it was like service. And I remember just chatting to Omar, who was my um, sous chef, and he was the one that kind of like scouted me. And I said to him, like, what do you want to do with your life? And he's like, the second I'm out of fine dining, the better. He says, it's just exhausted my whole life. I've committed my whole life. And for what? You know, I'm a sous chef. You know, I don't even have my own restaurant. Um, And because I respected him so much, I realized, you know what? Like, maybe this isn't the 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 path that i need to follow maybe i need to change um and i decided to change i quit that day i said to the head chef i was like listen i'm out of here and he was like if you ever um try and get a job anywhere else i'll make sure you never get a job in the kitchen again i was like well that's good because i don't want to work in kitchens anymore but in the meantime what was quite funny was um uh, i uh <laughs> i actually in the mate shift had to work in in restaurants and uh, they reference checked me and yeah, he gave horrible reference saying, yeah, you should not employ this guy. Yeah. So, but um, I should yeah. him up and say thanks. Yeah, yeah exactly. I can't remember his name, like Adam something, but, um, but yeah, basically just, uh, let's name and shame him. Yeah. Adam something. I can't yeah. remember. Oh, I can't remember his last. You time. know, you must've triggered something, right? You must've wound him up somewhere along the way for him to say that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because maybe he was jealous. Maybe he was pissed off. He wanted yeah. to leave. But he just had the balls to leave. Mm. I mean, the thing is, it's like, They'd given me an opportunity, right? They'd scouted me from college yeah. um, and given me this opportunity and saw this potential, but I just didn't want it. Do you know what I mean? I, I didn't, I, at that point, imagine, I mean, by the time I quit chefing, I was around 21 years old. You know, I'd, I'd been through so much and I'd forgot my first kitchen job when I was 14. I'd miss Christmases, I'd miss birthdays. I missed so much yes. in that early part. Yes. Um, and at the beginning, I loved it because it was independence and I was away from my reality but 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 when i got there i was like this is not what i want and and why 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 should i live my life like this when yes. i know that there's people out there especially i used to work work in bank so um in the financial part um 
of London. And I used to see these people walking to work in their suits, leaving at five o'clock. And I'm like, this... You envied them. Yeah, this is like the life, you know? We are very amazing at similarities. I was working, I was in hospitality till I was about 21, 22. And I worked New Year's Eve. And I had a Morris Miner. Do you remember Morris Miners? No. Exactly. It was the, it was built in 1965. It was a car that was older than me. Um, and I was driving home. It was like one in the morning. I missed whole New Year's Eve. Everybody was out. And I'm driving this crappy car. And the lights changed to amber before they changed. I went through the amber. Mm. And I remember changing behind me. The police stopped me. So you went through red lights. Breath test. So I've been working. I'm a chef here. The, the uh, breath test. I had garlic. So he went near the yellow and back down. So are you sure you have me? Anyway, they questioned me for about half an hour. I was like, I'm working my ass off. It's New Year's Day. I missed the whole New Year's Eve. And they gave me a fine. And the fine was higher than what I earned that night. Mm. And I just said, well, it's not for me. I left. I quit. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at I look at some of the people in the kitchen and, you know, it. you, you have to be, you have to not really like your life to do it, you know, because... It, it's non-stop. It's non-stop. It's thankless. It's hot. It's sweaty. So and anyway, we, well, there's lots of chefs and yeah. people working in kitchen listening. You know, we, we admire you. Mm. Yeah, I admire them for a yeah. uh, 100%. I take yeah. my hat off to them because if if you still love what you're doing and you yeah. love food that much to go to that point, then hats we, off. Again, we need chefs. We need people working in the yeah. kitchen to, so we can go to a restaurant. Yeah. I just couldn't do it myself. No, not it. anymore. Yeah. You serve the person. So yeah. you got into sales? Got into sales. My best friend, Rick. Um, he, uh, he got me a job at a car showroom and, uh, which, which dealership? So it was called car shop warehouse in, in the UK. Okay. So it was various cars. Yeah. So it. basically it was selling fleet cars. Mm -hmm. So there was super hard slogs, no discounts, no nothing. You know, we wouldn't show you more than three cars unless you were buying one. Do you know what I mean? That kind of vibe. So yeah, it, was, yeah. it was really harsh. Um, yes. and, uh, it was a great, it was a great college for sales because, um, I, I, I learned my first like kind of rejection there because and that was weird because when you go on a bounce of being rejected and people not buying from you you start to really doubt yourself mm -hmm. and then uh one guy who um who was my manager at the time he just pulled me to the side and was like listen you need to understand that it's not about what you're selling it's about you so people buy from people mm -hmm. and then they buy from you so stop focusing on what you're selling and start focusing on you mm -hmm. and that's what i did i just focused on myself um, and then, but you could have taken a rejection personally then, right? Because yeah. if they're rejecting, it's not the product, it's you. Yeah. So you could have been taken really badly, right? Yeah, but I was looking at it differently. You mm -hmm. know, I wasn't focusing on building that relationship with someone. It was all like, so that, that flipped in my mind and it's up with me to this day that like, you know, people will buy from you if they like you. Um, and you know, that was one of the, I think the biggest assets of information I could have had at that particular time, mm -hmm. because I took it with me for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the fact that people it's buy from people and, you know. It's the number one rule of sales. 100%. Yeah. And uh, then from there, um, I went to work for DFS, which was a manufacturer there. And I absolutely killed that one because it, for anyone that's from the UK will know that typically the average age of a salesman in DFS is around 40 to 55. You would have been half their age. And I was like 22 year old Danny. Retail, yeah. you were selling retail. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. They'd walk in, they'd try and set me up with their daughters. I, they, I had so much happen in that job. Like, I remember one woman asked me to do, um, her and her husband, they were quite fruity, and they asked me to do this, like, naked photography with them. But, like, On where, the couches from DFS. Where, but where you're not showing your body parts, but you're naked, you know. And I was like, the amount of requests I got was so crazy. Um, but it was... The question a, is, how many do you say yes to? None, none, no. Because I was... Shame on you, you didn't yeah. live your life. <laughs> I would have said yes to everything. I was living my life in other ways, but yeah. um, but uh, it was a great, it was a, again great learning curve, and then got into to I got poached to go into some property sales, and then that's what led me to coming in to Dubai. Okay, um, so what was that? So selling houses in the UK. Okay, for um, a developer. Yeah, yeah, and then what happened was is um, I got approached by some people that were here, mm -hmm. and they were like, "Do you want to come work for us?" Um, and then. I just I didn't even know anything about Dubai. So how long have you been here now? Ten years. Oh wow! So yeah. you're 24. Yeah, yeah. So oh, it all happened very quickly. Um, I like to call it the university of life. You know, um, I, I I didn't do too well in the education system, but I've I've, 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 I've got a lot of masters in the 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 university of life. But um, yeah, I just I, I 
I'd always thought that Sheffield was going to take me places. I'd always dreamed of being on the cruise ships, going to work in Australia, all that sort of stuff. And I remember saying to the next girlfriend, like, you know, I'm with you, but just to let you know, I have plans to leave travel. and travel and see the world and stuff like that. Um, but then obviously quit chefing and then Dubai came around and I didn't even ask too many questions. I was just like, I'm out. Do you know what I mean? I was 23 years old and I was just like, I'm ready to go. So accepted the job, sold everything that I had and left. Alone or do you have a partner at the time? I was alone. Okay. I was alone. My best friend Rick was here. Um, the one who also got helped me get mm -hmm. my first job. So we moved in together. I was staying in a small main Same group. company? You work for the same company or? No, no. So I worked for a real estate company for like two weeks okay. and then quickly came to realize that this company was a bit dodgy. So um, luckily got up, went to go and sell a house to the Syrian guy who owned a CCTV manufacturing company. He's like, come around my house. We'll do the deal here. We'll have dinner together. So I went round and he's like, listen, I'm not signing a contract, but here's another contract. Put it in front of me. And it was like this job to basically run his uh, manufacturing business wow. for CCTV. He says, I see something in you and I want you to, to lead the business. So, yeah, I mean, I got that from doing like zero to turning over five million dollars within a uh, a couple of years mm -hmm. um just by selling cctv to, mm -hmm. to manufacturers the guy that i was with me at the time is still there to this day and you know he always bless him he says to me like are oh, you my idol and that because well, i kind of set up the business for him to, yes. to then flourish it for himself and the owner is still in touch with you or do you, every guy... now and again i mean every now and again he's like ah oh, you know you want to come back to work for me and i'm that's nah, okay i'm done with cctv yeah yeah i mean he was a super emotional guy but um you know, it was a, I learned a lot of lessons from him because I learned how not to make decisions. Based and, on emotions. Based on emotions. Um, and What's an example? Um, he was close to as bipolar as... Do you have to trust these people, right? Huh? Maybe, maybe your father was bipolar uh, and he got this yeah, guy to yeah, bipolar. Yeah. I mean, I remember times where we would go in to a meeting on a Friday. You had no idea who was going to turn up. No. And it was like evening time. So like seven, eight o'clock at night. And he'd purposely like call us in to have a meeting to super sure. late. Mm. Um, and then he'd scream at us for an hour. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why did you? And I'm like, what? The, the, last do you know week what? Was great. Most people, they set the agenda before you even came in. It had nothing to do with, they just, their mood wanted to shout yeah. and take it out on people, irrespective of the results or the past week yeah. or anything. But I, again, I don't look back at that with any like remorse because mm. he allowed me to, to be who I needed to be presented to people. Like and you stuck it out for two he, years. He put me under a lot of pressure. Mm. Um, and you know, like, I mean, I remember I knew nothing about CCTV. And then within four weeks, I was presenting to a room of engineers about what these cameras did, the features and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was another thing that I learned from from that point onwards was you put me under pressure and I will thrive in that environment because, you know, I just I just won't. You didn't quit. I, don't, I won't accept failure. You didn't quit. No. You could have the easier job. I would have quit. Yeah. I would have said, you know, my ego doesn't need this shit. I'll quit. Mm. But you didn't. Yeah, I, I admire that actually. Yeah, I mean, the humility inside of me made me think at that point was that I kind of needed this. And also, uh, I think to a certain extent, I, I didn't deserve more than that, which made me put up with it for, for a while mm -hmm. um, until I actually built my own confidence within. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, and then that then led me on to um, getting in construction. Um, and when you say construction is where you are right now yeah, yeah interior fit out so uh -huh, it's interior fit out yeah so we do like design and decoration of the inside of buildings whether it's like a healthcare facility all the way up to a restaurant hotel you name it offices so it's commercial not uh yeah personal or yeah no, no, it's all commercial stuff so revenue driving projects really um and yeah worked in a couple of businesses um and then got this opportunity to be within this business uh that i'm in now and um was nothing when we when we started um you know we was in a considerable amount of debt and within six months was able to turn it around into a profit and then built it to turning over over 200 million a year in the space of six years do you have a team working for you yes yeah, so we've got over 350 people in the, in the team um and then um and then in my team around seven people mm -hmm. 
so yeah predominantly my role is just to like grow the business and mm -hmm. and manage relationships and and win projects basically mm -hmm. so, so parent company which country saudi saudi okay. yeah, yeah great family to be fair like so, so this business um does it come through referrals leads or you door knocking yeah for the first first few years it was it was hardcore like mm -hmm. it was it was a graft do you know what i mean like mm -hmm. we had to build a name for ourselves mm -hmm. um so a lot of sleepless nights a lot of like working hard but that was a great goal because um you know i'd been brought in from an, an early point where i felt like i was a part of something um how many people worked for you then at the beginning it was uh only a couple i think i'd like two or three people working underneath me the whole organization oh so there was about 250 people then okay. so yeah so we had to basically change the mindset of the way that they were all thinking because mm -hmm. at that point they'd only ever done projects within the group oh, which see. was their own retail stores okay. and stuff like that so we had to get them thinking like how they to grow you need to go outside exactly 100 mm -hmm. um but yeah and then and you know within the group this year i got recognized as the biggest contributor towards sales which is an achievement in itself because we turn over around a billion dirhams a year wow. um and my team got best commercial team of the year wow. without the whole group and stuff so you know it's weird it's like you know i just as i say i, I never i think these are the moments where i sit with my blinkers on and i'm just for focused forward and i and i i my girlfriend always says it to me she's like we have to celebrate things like this, like the tiny little things, you know, whether it's the setup of the business that I've just done, um, my first sale or getting these awards because it's a recognition of your hard work. And, you know, I think because I'm so set on my goals is I don't, I just look at that and I'm like, okay, great. Next. Next. Uh, when, like, How long have you met your partner recently, right? So we've been together for just over a year. Yeah, just over okay. a year. How did you meet her? Bumble, yeah. Okay, so uh, I don't I don't know about sites. So uh, you got to meet her. She's British, Brazilian, Brazilian. Yeah. What is it about her that you like, and what is it that she sees in you mm. that she wants to? Do, does she look at you and think oh, he's not happy enough? He needs to celebrate his wins. Yeah. Uh, um, I think because she knows that I'm my biggest critic. Like I, you know, when we first met, and it, and I mean. For those uh, people that don't, obviously don't know me, like I, I struggled to commit to people because again, after doing lots of therapy, I realized that what happened with my parents uh, scarred me for a long time, you know, and I didn't want to commit because I associated love with pain, you know, and that was also the same for my relationship choices as well. I chose relationships that would cause me pain rather than joy. Um, and all the nice people that came into my life, you know, just, just cropped them off. Them. Yeah, 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 you know, uh, and it was almost like I never wanted myself to be happy uh, until the point of where I got to the point where I was having extremely casual relationships all the time. Mm -hmm. And I felt empty, you know, I felt, you know, what what people look at and think, oh, that would be an amazing situation. You know, fun all the time. And yeah, and I remember w waking up one moment and, you know, I was next to this, what would be classed as a beautiful woman. Um, and I just felt so empty. And I realized from that moment onwards, I had to change my life choices because if it wasn't serving me, then why are you doing it? Yeah. Um, and I went completely teetotal on everything, alcohol and women and everything and just focused on what- and How many days? <laughs> no, for for a long time, and that's what led about me to a week meet, and a half. That's what led me to meet my 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 girlfriend Andressa because I knew what I wanted. Like at the time, we we actually started talking a couple of years before we actually met. But I wasn't looking for anything serious. I was mm -hmm. looking for casual, mm -hmm. and she is a super respectful woman. Um, and she's older than you. She's three years younger than me. Wow. So yeah, so she she's um we we met and. You know, I, I knew what I wanted from life and she 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 ticks a lot of those boxes. And, you know, she's, um, you know, it's not with it's been ups and downs because, you know, cultural, you know, everyone thinks about relationships and dating all these hot Latino birds. And but 
that also comes with cultural differences mm -hmm. but you know i love her to pieces and she's she's a great woman and she's she's by my side and you know she she loves me for me not for for what i am who i am what i have she loves me for for what's inside and that's so important because if one day i was to lose it all you know she's still going to be there you know um you think i'm just no, kidding no, no, no. Just, I, I know i'm but, just kidding because, you put it yeah, i'm sure you put it through there yeah so yeah i mean I, just yeah you know, around. there's a so there's, there's a few times she could have walked away to be fair yeah. um but she's still here so you know and i when i first met her like i knew she was special so for her as well like i treat her differently mm -hmm. to how mm -hmm. other people treat her she she was very misunderstood by you know, she used to tell me all these stories about dates, and I'm like, oh my god, like nightmare. How can a man somebody even think of it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, say these things, um, but we just clicked, and you know, she's 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 like my best friend. So that's, that's just great. Beautiful, so, beautiful. Yeah, because I think when we met, you were just the beginning of your relationship. Yeah, yeah exactly. So and it's it's flourished. You know, I've, I've just asked her to move in with me, so she'll that's be moving great. in, um, which is great. She said yes. <laughs> she did reluctantly she's like yeah. you've got to be a little bit more tidy um and you've got to move all these cosmetic products aside <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly so um but no it's uh it's the next step do you know what i mean i'm, I'm gonna be well, i'm 34 and a half now so i'm gonna be 35 soon and it's about time you know we want to see how we we live together we get on really well so mm -hmm. it's just about can we live together and then next we, step. we can live together and then you know it's about making it a lot more serious and and planning those next steps i'm sure you're going to be amazing both of you yeah thank you so um you start tell me about your podcasts so you got this amazing job you're doing really well and then somewhere along the way you thought podcasts yeah. so why? i what happened was is i again it's weird because i don't know where this constant need to improve myself come from like i out of all the soul searching i've done this is still something that i just don't know how i've been able to to learn but um i remember i'd presented this uh this sales coach to um to my boss and uh he was like oh, I, 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 no not interested but i saw some value in it and so i paid for it myself to do one to one mentoring with him because not only his network, but also other things. Um, and I thought, what's the worst that can happen if it doesn't work out? And I've, I've lost a bit of money, but you know, ultimately, if it does work out, then then and then it's it's been a good thing. And um, it did work out, and it went really well. And he taught me some really good things from a sales perspective. But also, his network was amazing that I got introduced to, and they're still some of my friends to this day. Do you mind if I mention names of this sales? Uh, Spencer Lodge. Oh, I know Spencer yeah, very well. Yeah, 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 a lot of people know Spencer. Yeah. So, yeah, so I did. Do you one, have one on one, one to one? Yeah, I did one to ones with him. Yeah, and um, you know, it was it was great because then he turned around to me and he said, "You need to do a podcast." Um, How long ago was this? This was four years ago. Okay. So straight away, being the person that I am, got the equipment, started a podcast. I'd got, done it so quickly, I didn't even know what I wanted to talk about, but. Um, I was like, right, what's going what, what I struggled with the most was getting in the room with the C level guys for the business I wanted to pitch to them. Mm -hmm. So I changed the approach to narrative. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I've got this podcast. Do you want to come on and talk about your story? So you were indirectly stealthing yeah. them. So everybody was like, yeah, no worries. Yeah. It's like, nobody said no to me. Mm -hmm. Everyone was just coming onto this show. Mm -hmm. Um, but at that moment, um, they didn't know they were being used. No, 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 tools no, to no, be sold to. no, but, um, but what, ha what had happened was it was causing a bit of conflict in my workplace, mm -hmm. um, because they I didn't thought, like it. They thought that the agenda was myself, not the business. Mm -hmm. So I was like, no problem. I'm not going to keep talking about this. If you don't see the value, I'll, I'm going to take this, I'm going to buy the domains and it's going to be my show and I'm going to talk to whoever I want. And I'm, I'm I won't, it'll be a separate thing mm -hmm. and I won't mention anything to do with the business. If, if, Crazy. if you don't see the value in it. Yeah. So did it myself. And then, you know, now we're like one of the leading personal and business success podcasts in, in the UAE, you know, and all along it's been costing you because to hire that studio is costing you. Yeah, time yeah. is costing you. Yeah. Yeah. But mm -hmm. the, you know, we're looking at short term cost here, but the long term gain has been mm -hmm. fantastic. Like I've met people like yourself okay. and become friends with people like you and, and other people that 
at the drop of a hat I can pick up the phone and have advice on anything but I did cancel the last couple of times it's shamefully like, yeah. Yeah. no 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 it's okay I blame you on Alexa no yeah but um <laughs> but the point that I'm getting at is that 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 it's indirectly it's helped me massively you know and you know it's it's helped me evolve as a person because i've been able to like gain so much emotional intelligence on myself and other people's mm -hmm. situation it's made me a better person mm -hmm. um you know being able to have really vulnerable conversations with people and have no fear and 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 people trust me with mm -hmm. that sort of stuff like you know this woman who was the she's like uh from the uk she, one of the fastest uh soup businesses in the uk um won all sorts of awards and just out of nowhere she just started on the podcast started talking about how she'd started the business because her husband had cheated on her with her best friend and afterwards she's like i don't know Never how we managed to talk about this but you just made me feel so comfortable in the conversation mm -hmm. that i opened up and i have these conversations with everyone um you know it's that gift that uh, talent gift so combination of both i'll go into these conversations thinking um we're going to talk about business and then next thing you know i know everything about them and all the tiny intricate details it's because it's been able to have just a just a normal conversation because you're real when you're real and you have a i say childlike interest in the other person yeah they feel it yeah and and it's and, not pretense it's not a list of questions to ask because i haven't even looked at one exactly. line yet yeah because the conversation just flowing, is yeah. flowing yeah exactly you know and that it's you know we, don't get me wrong with podcasts when i speak to guests i will prepare questions but a lot of the time i'll go to the end of it just like we've done mm -hmm. with this episode mm -hmm. and you just wouldn't have spoken you know, half the questions because the conversations has flowed and, and that, that's what happens um so yeah so uh, starting a podcast was was the best thing mm -hmm. you know even though times where i'm super busy mm -hmm. i've met some incredible people like i can't even tell you some of the people i've met that are just superhuman that do you approach them yourself it depends mm -hmm. so it depends on the topic so i'm starting to diversify my topics a lot more now so i'm talking a lot within nutrition and obviously within the beauty space and and wellness and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. um so that that yes i do but a lot of the time i get sent profiles by pr businesses and, and wow. that's how we got connected wow, wow. you know pr agencies will reach out to me say hey do you wanna um which now to you one of our yeah which is good now client. because now i charge media packages for certain types of guests Amazing. um where you know and, and i'm getting approached by businesses all the time which want me to be the front of their kind of media of their business and stuff like that so you know i mean and i even recently got um approached recently for um to basically create a curriculum for podcasting in schooling now and teaching kids how to podcast wow, so yeah there's so much stuff that's coming off the back of it now and and it's... the question is where well, you're going to have time for your full-time job yeah yeah and we've got to talk about a new business yeah well. yeah so i mean listen i am i i won't i'm such a go-getter that i can't i can't fail you know so these things are outside noises that I concentrate on in my own time. You know, my, my dedication to growing um, the business, mm -hmm. the, the KOJ business is still there. You know, I still am the biggest contributor for sales um, and I'm still doing my job that I'm paid to do. Mm -hmm. you know? And more. And more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, it's just that my own ambitions, you know. So tell me, tell me three things you learned from your uh sales coaching that you feel it helped you out and i'm going to add the question back on the back of that tell yeah. me three things you learned from because you already established you're still doing well but you put yourself on some sales coaching yeah so what three things did you learn my mindset so uh i always felt like these people were above me and i had mm -hmm. to change that because I, you know i need them to know mm -hmm. that them meeting me is going to add the value to their life okay. not the other way around okay so that was often people thinking sales just because the other person's got the dollars yeah they're king yeah and exactly. that's not necessarily the case they're one part with it unless you added more value than the money in their pocket 100 percent. Right? so that was one of the biggest mindset mindset shifts and at that time as well when i first started like with koj five and a half years ago however long it was now um i wasn't the the king that i thought i was mm -hmm. i was very insecure 
um you know and I, I i knew that i needed to improve so with that came insecurities about meeting these high level guys just yeah. in case they're like well who are you like where mm -hmm. do you come from yeah like, how can you teach they're me gonna anything? find out yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah um and then one of the other biggest things that I took away was obviously starting the podcast mm -hmm. um that helped me massively mm -hmm. um different tactics of tactics of approach you know, I wasn't very tactical at the beginning, you know, it was just kind of like, just keep going, go, 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 go. Um, whereas I changed the tactics in, in my approach. And then the network was just say yes to every single opportunity. It was mm -hmm. such basic things that I'd learned, but mm -hmm. that's what meant the most. And to be honest with you, um, presenting as well was, was also key how I presented myself because one thing they got us doing on the sales coaching was talking into a camera confidently about what we did. And that was very, very awkward, daunting, and and embarrassing. You see and every little exactly. detail, yeah. and you you pick up all the tiny little ticks that you have, like whether it's ums or this or that, whatever it might be. Um, so, as I just said there, um, um, but <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, we're gonna say it all the time. It's like when you say "don't say but" or however, and we exactly, kept saying, yeah, "You yeah, know yeah. when I when I was in Canberra when I was there, when I was learning, I used to swivel on my chair, not realizing." As I was thinking, I was going left and right. And I looked yeah. at the camera, I thought, no, my God, the other person should be feeling seasick looking at me. So, so I used to say a lot of, you know, you mm -hmm. know, you know, this. To fill know. the gaps. And it wasn't even just to fill the gaps. I suppose it, I don't know how it even Beckham used to do it all the time. You know, and he used to, with his high pitched voice, mm. that, that stopped. He had some coaching. But, but Beckham it, at the beginning used to do that all the time. Yeah. And it's, it's so important, I think, because I was at the beginning of my podcasting journey. And this was, again, another th thing that I learned on, on, on the sales training is learn when to stop talking. Mm -hmm. So allow the other person to speak. You have two ears, one mouth. So Just let that, that be your guide. So that was one, one big thing, because if I was talking about a sale or whatever it might be, I'd carry on talking. Whereas you just have to literally, okay, so we've we've made sure we've ticked all the boxes now we're given x y z and now we're going to do do the deal right mm -hmm. and then whoever breaks the silence loses yeah. and you're nodding and so um to go on the sales training was a big chunk of your earnings right it was it was a lot yeah mm -hmm. it was a lot um but so what made you do that because a lot of people we have huge followers and they don't want to invest in their own personal training. They can't value it because they're not. And then they go and spend a huge amount of money on a meal mm -hmm. or a car or a yeah. holiday, but they don't invest in themselves. Yeah, I think I spoke about this on my podcast recently with a coach and everybody's a coach now, aren't they? You know, but the reason why I worked with Spencer at the time is because I saw him everywhere. I saw him everywhere. He was all online. I mean, this is before video content was was really a thing he was very pro he's yeah. not so proactive now because he's yeah. changing yeah course, but exactly. before he was he was everywhere so i used to see him as my biggest competition at the time yeah we didn't realize nobody's competitive really it's just the market's you, big enough for everyone yeah you're an industry you, right you make your own mark and that's it yeah and it was uh you know i'd seen him and for me whether this is the right or wrong way to look at things I will always look at an individual and go, what have they done with their life? Especially if it's a sales coach. If you are a self-made millionaire who's built businesses, sold businesses. You can learn from this. You person. can learn from it. Yeah. And and that was some of the value. And and I remember speaking to to Lewis Alsop about Spencer and he said, Yeah, he's he's worth he's worth every single penny. Mm -hmm. Um so that was that was great. And the funny thing is, is we were on a group course and there's only two of the, the guys that really pushed on from there. And that was myself and Joe uh, Woodhouse, who's done amazing things with his content. And we just stuck with those principles of stuff that he taught us. Wow. And to look at where we were then to where we are now, it's, yeah. it's, it's, so it definitely, it definitely helped. Do you know where, as, as a coach goes, I've got to the end of, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to do it anymore, but then you have one success. Yeah. And then he inspires you again to keep doing it. Yeah, so, yeah it's like uh, it's like the podcast. I love doing the podcast, but you know, finding time for it is so difficult. And do you know what's really frustrating is when people now, because people's attention is so short, that a lot of the guys will comment on the Instagram stories and the TikTok stories and stuff like that, but not watch the full episode. 
and you put everything into that episode that sometimes you think is going to go amazingly and it doesn't go that well and you think should I keep doing this? Do people even want to see this anymore? But then you get that one message from somebody who says, this has helped me so much. Thank you so much. Like I, I did one about traveling, uh, like, you know, never be afraid to quit your job and go traveling with one of my good friends, James, who at the peak of his career, quit his job and went traveling for a year, you know? And that one, one girl messaged me. She said, local girl, she said, I've just quit my job. And I'm going to go traveling because well, this cool. has inspired me. And there's other ones where the, the, I suppose the, 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 the biggest impact one I would say was, well, there's a couple actually, but there was a, there was an emotional eating coach, Natasha, and the amount of people that that touched was just like, wow. And then there was another one I did with a guy called Adil Hussein, mm -hmm. who's a masculinity coach. Okay. And the amount of men that popped out of nowhere that were just like, wow, I feel I'm, it. I'm so glad. I felt like I was talking in that conversation mm -hmm. because it was a real moment where two men just wasn't being sexist at all. It was just talking about how we feel as men mm -hmm. and how we are misunderstood, mm -hmm. you know? So being able to have these conversations on, on a regular basis, you know, it just gives you that. that it inspires you. Exactly. Because it is a thankless job. Yeah. The haters are for, far louder than the lovers. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, it's the same. I was in Manchester this weekend and a lady came in the restaurant. I said, I follow your post and they're so inspiring. It was like, wow, somebody in Manchester mm. recognized me. You know, it was, then it lifts you up, right? Yeah. But then uh, I stopped, I st really, I've stopped responding or listening because a lot of it is, I don't sell anything. Yeah. Well, when people listen, oh, you're always trying to sell something. I obviously not watching anything because I'm not selling anything. Mm -hmm. And this is costing me time and money and effort. True. Yeah. Um, but then here we are. People don't understand that, you know, and oh, now I've said, you know, I'm now saying it all the time. So I'm going to love you for it. Come on. So a lot of people are suffering with their own demons. So reflect it. Onto they reflect it onto, onto others. Mm -hmm. And that's mainly down to their own core values that they think I'm, you're just trying to sell something because in a nutshell, when they say that it's because all they're trying to do is sell something to other people as well. You know, so they think that they, you have the same ethics when realistically, you There's know, nothing. We just producing these podcasts and these conversations is a cost to you, but you're doing it because you're hoping that one person will listen to this and find some value. And this is exactly the same for, for my You work. edit your own videos and everything you do yourself. You have I, have, I have a team doing that for me now. Even that's costing you. Exactly, yeah. So this behind the scenes is a production team and stuff. So, yeah. But yeah, it's like, it's, you know, I, I, I said this to someone the other day and you go to the gym, you pay for that. It's a hobby for you, right? And it's exactly the way that I see my podcast now. It's, it's a hobby that I enjoy doing. Um, it's a therapy session for me sometimes. It's a sales training session for me sometimes. It's so much more than just a podcast. So being able to have that on a, on a regular basis helps me. So it's, it's almost like going to the gym and just paying for, for an entry fee to go to the gym, you know? So that's, that's a mind gym. Exactly, exactly. It gets your mind thinking and, and having amazing How many do you do a week, a month? Three now. Wow, Three. you used to do more. I used to do more, but what I wanted to do was try and get the most out of all the content that I was producing. Mm -hmm. So rather than do massive quantities, what? which is hard when you put out one, people don't realize when you put out one podcast a week, how difficult that actually is to manage. And if you have a lot of time, which none of us really do, mm -hmm. it, it really is difficult to, to manage that time going mm -hmm. through all the edits, making sure that it's been done correctly. Make Then you've got the platforms, then you've then got, you got to promote it to make sure that you exactly the right target season whilst it's whilst it's on there you've got to keep pushing pushing the episode and all that sort of stuff so and that that sometimes i've had guests come on that that approach me to be on the show and i say to them all i want from you in return is to promote the episode mm -hmm. and sometimes when they don't promote it it's just i remember one guy i won't name names because it's not appropriate but i took all of his advertisement off i edited all of the the where he worked out and it was just about why do you want to promote that person if they're yeah. not even bothered promoting and it was all about health and nutrition instead mm -hmm. of actually him talking about his business because he was just like my audience is bigger than yours anyway and i was just like wow mm -hmm. 
But that's there. Are, there, there are t- I, I did a podcast. Well, I'm not going to mention these. Two and a half hours. Couldn't get the guy to stop talking. There was not one nugget out of it. Not one single nugget that I could cut out. So I just put the whole two and a half hours on. And uh, it was totally pointless. Mm. And I sat down to kill myself. But then you can have a one hour conversation and put 20, 30 nuggets out of it. Yeah. It's amazing. You just hit it off with some people, some people you don't. Yeah. But don't promote them. Yeah. yeah. So what made you start your own business? This is what I've been really looking forward to. Yeah. Question. So Because the industry you've chosen is not an easy industry mm. to get into. So I, I've been approached so much over the last few years, especially with having the podcast and the platform now. Mm-hmm. A lot of people want me to be the face of their investments. Okay. What uh, does that mean? Uh, face of their investment. What does that mean? So modeling people want to invest in me but i'll be the face of that business because so let's say let's say uh i'm a car yeah. company or a, a men's clothing line mm. okay well how do they approach you they said right i want you to do your podcast and then put my label behind your name so most of it actually is within the industry that i work in okay. i get that a lot where okay. people will come up and say you've obviously got the network to to, to do a lot of business um and you you can run it and we'll invest it and for me uh having worked in this industry now for eight years i know how difficult difficult it can be working with certain clients and stuff so i've already said to myself i will never set up my own fit out company plus i am very thankful for the opportunity that my current business has given me so i wouldn't go and stab them in the back by setting up another business and being a competitor Mm -hmm. just wouldn't just wouldn't do it um, but, um, I've always been fascinated about business and, and with the podcast, I just, and being a go-getter and never being happy with what I've got and wanting to achieve more. I realized when I was sitting down with these, these people and having conversations about business that they weren't too dissimilar to me. It's just that they had got the idea and gone off and ran with it. And then I had a conversation and it was with a, uh, a guy who very similar to me, to be honest. He was an architect by trade and then decided he wanted to do his own thing, quit his job and went to manage a wellness retreat in Thailand. And now he's a blood sugar coach, helping people lose weight just by controlling their blood sugar. Wow. And he's got some amazing, amazing results. And uh, it's not, connect me with this guy, please. Yeah, because I actually need that. Yeah, and he, he said to me about, on the wellness retreat, about how he how they all wash, like showered and stuff with lime juice and proper natural products. Mm-hmm. And I'd always been into my upkeep and my grooming and stuff, but I was mm-hmm. never conscious about what was in a product because mm-hmm. I'm, I was a product of the marketing. I just went with whatever looked good yeah. rather than what was actually good. Mm-hmm. And he said something to me and the sentence was, if you doesn't, if you don't understand the ingredient, then neither does your body. And it stuck with me. So I went away and I started researching everything that was in my products. How long ago was this? Around three years ago. Wow. Yeah, just after COVID in, in 2020. And um, I, I I just started researching and first few ingredients that was in the products checked out and it was fine. And then one ingredient that literally blew my mind that I couldn't believe that it was in cosmetics products. And it's an ingredient for those that are listening called phenoxyphenol. It's one of the most common preservatives and for some reason it's been approved by the uh fda but it's been approved by fda by ecosa everyone that's a governing body that approves natural ingredients mm-hmm. um or well, as but, a natural ing- ingredient no no, no right? but it's been it's been exempt okay so yes it's on the exclusions list yes. of what's bad now this is an ingredient that is made from two carcinogenic compounds and is toxic to the human body if it's consumed in more than 1% concentration. So it's a highly toxic ingredient. And this is found in nappies, baby wipes, shampoo, shower gels, face care, hair care, you name it, your, your hand soaps, everything. And all it is, is it's a preservative that just prolongs the life of the product. And I just couldn't believe. I it's a poison. It. It's a poison, yeah. Now, if it's a, if you're allowed to use up to 1% concentration, then, but it's in every single product you use, surely that means that you are higher concentration, positive, yeah. uh, consuming higher concentrations. And I just thought it was, it was like, it was, I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. And all of a sudden I started to find myself being super passionate 
about this industry and super passionate about getting to the bottom of what this industry really stands for and what we really are putting onto our bodies. Now, for people like I've had I've had these skeptical people like comment on on stuff that I've said before and they're like, what? So we're gonna just drop dead when we use a moisturizer. Now, no, that's not what's gonna happen. But anyone that has a clue about disease, it comes most diseases come from when your body is constantly inflamed. Now, if you're constantly putting chemicals onto your body, now this this is data that people can research. A woman on average will come into contact with 167 chemicals per day just from what they put on their skin. And for me, that was the mind biggest blood. organ on the body. Exactly. Biggest organ on the body. You've got 300,000 sweat glands in a square inch of your skin. So everything that goes onto your skin goes into your skin. So sure. I was just finding out all this information. And then next thing you know, the next ingredient I found affected testosterone levels and sperm quality. Uh, then there was an emulsifier in some high street products that you would find in paint, um, petrol derivatives, all these. You could smell it. They can uh, not smell it. It's all in the research. It's all in the research. No, no, no. So it's in petrol, for instance. But by smelling it, by the order, you're actually taking this stuff in. Yeah, no. So oh. wait, this. So it's in these. It's in these. So, uh, so a lot of chemicals that come from it all are derived from petrochemicals. Yeah, of, yes. So. Of it, yeah. These, these are like ingredients that are included into, and that's whether that's through emulsifiers, whether Bigger thickening product. agents right. okay. and stuff like okay. this. Indeed. You wouldn't necessarily smell it. Indeed, indeed. But if I was to say to you, Darius, would you put the same emulsifier that is in paint onto your skin? You'd be like, no. And it's yeah. the same for all these ingredients. And they all have, uh, uh, you, you imagine, if you put paint on your skin, your body is going to be like, what on earth is going on with this? Like, You're sick in other areas. Attack, yeah, attack, exactly. attack, you know, so... And I think this is one of the reasons why, I mean, when I was a kid, you would never hear about children getting ill like they are nowadays. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that it is a part, what one of the biggest parts to it is because of all these foreign things we have around our body, which is causing constant inflammation. Mm -hmm. And you all have certain body types that are able to fight off against it and be healthy. And, and that also is down to nutrition and all these sort of things. Um, but then you'll have other bodies that would not be able to cope with it. And, I just started to become so fascinated about this topic that I built all this research on from dermatology reports on what was good for the skin. So then I started to come up with the ingredients. Okay, this is the source. This is what it does for this. And, and at the beginning, I was just going to make my own skincare. And then I sat down with a friend for a coffee and I told her about it. And she's like, you have to start a skincare brand. And I was like, okay but I know nothing about it. And she was like, well, I work in retail. I can help you. And every weekend I would spend time, you know, every holiday I would go to a beauty expo to try and meet manufacturers and all that sort of stuff. And, I, and in my spare time, I dedicated my whole life to, to, to finding uh, a manufacturer that would help me make the products that I wanted to make. And my, my goal was, and I, having the podcast, I was able to talk to a lot of business owners, right? And at the beginning, I wanted to do all these products. And, and I remember one of my friends, Seb, he he has a successful nutrition business, like Gummy Nutrition's in the UK. And he sat down and he said, listen, I understand that you feel passionate about this. But we, save the planet. we have to think logically here. You can't launch with too many products because it's going to be a huge investment. Um, so launch with a few products and off you go. So then I came up with the, the ingredients list for these products. And then the hardest part was then finding a manufacturer because the skincare industry, everyone jokes around about how everyone's starting a skincare brand. And that's true because people can go to a factory tomorrow and get a white label product mm -hmm. off the shelf. <laughs> They'll do all the branding, everything. Yeah. So this is why Brad Pitt's got his own skincare range now. This is why that Travis guy out of Blink-182 has got his own skincare, because he's going to these factories or these factories. Oh, stick, I stick my name, I make 10 million a month. So that's it, yeah. Exactly, and especially with these networks, because Correct. people will buy from them. Correct. Like the Kardashians, all these guys, like, right. it's very easy for them to start a, start a brand. Mm -hmm. But for me, I was like, I don't want your white label, so this is what I want. And they're like, oh, okay, we can do that for you, but it's 50,000 MOQ, mm -hmm. which was hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. oh, I don't have that. And then finally, I was able to meet a manufacturer and they sat there and they were like, I absolutely love this concept. Wow. 
and we are prepared to help you and grow with you on this journey. And that was when I was like, wow, it's official. Like I'm going to have uh, a skincare brand. And I went through two years of testing. So concentration of formulas and, and stuff like that, because do you have to get approvals? Yeah, we have to do approvals. So, um, it, which, which blows my mind on how some of these products are actually managed to get on the shelves here. Um, but I went through, through two years of testing on products and, <laughs> you know, making sure that every single ingredient comes from a natural source, even the scents come from a natural scent. Wow. Um, which again is another thing. Sense is, is one of the, the biggest hormone disruptors to, to the human body nowadays because they come from so many synthetic chemicals, but yeah, I worked on it and went through about 10 revisions and the manufacturer was at one point was just like, Danny, <laughs> no. come on. Like, no. and I, I said to them, I said, no problem. It's only going to be a couple more, but it has to be right. It has to be right. And especially for me as a consumer, one thing that I wanted to make sure was that when people use them, there's a feeling because when you use certain moisturizers now and different products, you feel nothing. And you know, is this even working? Um, but for me, everything has to have a feeling. So every product we have has a feeling. So with the face scrub that we have, it makes your skin feel super, clean afterwards so it's got tiny bits of charcoal in there so you know because of the texture it's going to be uh, a gentle exfoliator but then with what we've done is unlike other face washes is we have uh, uh, an oil from grapeseed which is almost like the identical um type of oil as the oil we produce in our skin mm -hmm. so that when you use the face wash it absorbs better yeah, but also leaves your skin moisturized mm -hmm. afterwards because one of the biggest things we found from the research that we did the dryness was happened. it dries your skin afterwards and that's what we didn't want. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've got guys that are calling me up saying, oh my God, I was using Chanel, CeraVe, Tom Ford, you know, all these big brands all around the world. And they're like, they're now using these products. So what are these products called? So it's called Ansem Skin. Ansem. Yeah, it's a play and on the you word. Get a, uh -huh. It's a play on the word handsome. Okay. So... Um, so uh, right now it's a male product it's a male it's a natural skincare range for men um all the packaging that we have like the tubes is made from sugar cane we only use um fsc regulated um cardboard yes uh, all the inks we use is water-based inks mm -hmm. so again this is stuff that i learned on the way mm -hmm. that packaging nowadays is just full of plastic like even ink is made from plastic now so even if you think like coca-cola will put recycle me but yeah. you can't recycle that can because it's made like the ink that they use. It can't be recycled, but it's a tick box that will still go to landfill. It won't be recycled. So for me, I want it to be truly, I want it to be guilt free. Yeah. I want it to be guilt free wow. on this journey because I don't want anything to come up on me and go, oh, well, you've done this. Um, so I, I led with um, a good heart and a clean conscience. And then for every product we sell, we plant a tree in over 47 reforestation projects around the world. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that important? Now, um, again, this is another thing that I've learned. I work with a, a tree planting charity called One Tree Planted, and they, they, I mean, they've they've done they've got all the data now, and forty six percent of the world's forests are now destroyed. Whether that's for crops, for lands, whatever it might be, um, mining, you name it. Now. Planting trees is so important for everything that we do. Like just to, if you think about if we wiped out all the trees today, we couldn't breathe because there's no absorption of the carbon dioxide. And it's so important to preventing of floods because uh, the trees absorb the water from, from, from the ground. So there's, there's so many different positives to this. Now, one of the other positives to it is that this also creates an economy for the reforestation projects we work in because these these reforestation projects are so rural that these villagers they don't have jobs they find it hard to to, to earn money and stuff so some of these so you um, indirectly helping people exactly so jobs being exactly. good for environment there's there's so how many products do i have to buy for you to to plant a tree <laughs> so every product wow, every product seriously wow. yeah so in our first does month, that make your products really expensive no so how do you price it um, so, I mean, from our side, it's, it's priced with, you know, I mean, I'm being it, difficult. It's a silly question on purpose yeah. with me. I mean, so our, if somebody's listening and thinking, well, I'm going to be helping yeah. so many people. So the price will be really expensive. Well, I, I had someone leave a review on the website the other day and said, I usually use Chanel, Chanel products, but I wanted to buy these products 
and see how they figured like and how they felt but due to the price point i assumed they were going to be like every other high street product but i have now thrown away my chanel creams and i'm only using this because it makes my skin feel amazing now a chanel moisturizing 50 ml i looked this up i didn't realize from before it's 300 dirhams mm -hmm. you can buy a face scrub a serum and a moisturizer for from time. us for 376 dirhams okay so you're getting a full facial set that's actually good for your skin mm -hmm. um, and packed full of active ingredients for only 76 dirhams more. So it was priced super competitively because I didn't want us, I didn't want the, the entry to market for, for us to be too high for, At the beginning. you know, my, my goal is to make skincare, natural skincare accessible for all men. Not, and not can you sell these men. all over the world? Or yeah right now yeah it's i mean at the moment i'm focusing mainly on the uae but i have had okay. orders in thailand i've had orders in the uk like random countries just pop up out of nowhere i'm starting to get a lot of interest in the states as well but because all the fulfillment comes from the uae i'm yeah. focusing on the uae market oh, wow so it's all done here yeah yeah incredible yeah. yeah so so yeah and it's 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 like a little it's like my my passion really um it's something that i just came across on and i, I spent three years of every evening, every weekend, dedicated to to getting this up to, to, to the point of where it is today. And then we was able to launch online five weeks ago. And some. Yeah, and some skin. So if there's any way I can help you launch it, make it bigger, anything, I'm here for you. Thank you so I much. I didn't know the story and the ingredients and stuff. So I want to place an order today. Yep. Can I have the pack? Yeah, of course. I'll no. make sure. Um, I'm, I'll Send make, me a link and I'll take it. We've got, um, so we also have toiletry bags as well, which, okay. Um, are made from recycled plastic bottles, okay. which come from the ocean. So all, all PCR plastics, and uh, there's around 25 bottles per toiletry bag. But if you look at it, it it's it's um it's it looks exactly like a normal toiletry bag, except for the fact that we're taking plastic out of the system and and creating so something from it. like Emirates. Yeah, seriously, this because is I've got these the bags from Emirates first everywhere, yeah. and I'm like. Of course, the brand. Yeah, you know, the brand. this is this is the goal. Eventually, mm. I think from from my side is I want to learn how to walk before we can run. Mm -hmm. And if it goes crazy now, mm -hmm. then it might be a bit difficult because of like growth yeah. aspects and stuff like that. But um, I'm prepared to to do what it takes to make this a success because I just feel so passionately about it. You know, man, it's going to be a success no matter what. I know it. It's just when. Thank you. Well, this is the first time I've truly opened up and spoken about not only my journey, but also the business side of things as well. Um, so it'll be amazing to to go go back in five years time and be like, wow, do you remember that conversation? Yeah, what do you mean five years? Six months. We talked about <laughs> five years. Five years still, I might not be alive then. Let's just push this like yeah. an exit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. hundred percent. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's been great at the moment from from an organic sale perspective which has been amazing. Now we're going down the ad space. And also I've got a lot of women messaging me saying, I bought this for my husband and Can I'm actually it? using it myself wow. and ordering more for themselves. Wow. Um, yeah, I had one of my good friends um, message me as well. And he was, he's very particular. He's a um, black guy. And the reason why I'm mentioning black is because his, that, skin, yeah, yeah, his skin yeah. is super yeah, dry. And, stuff like and he was saying to me, I only ever use one product for my whole life, but this, smashes it like one of my other friends who had alopecia mm -hmm. and has super dry skin he i spoke to him on the phone the other day and he said to me you know i stopped using this because i'd i'd left a new package at work and i'd ran out of the the face scrub and he's got a bold head and he sometimes gets bumps from like mm -hmm. shaving at the mm -hmm. back and that and he was like after not using it for a few days my skin started to get worse and then i started you I, I then it made me not forget it i took it home started using it again and now my skin feels great again and again the person inside of me of being this person which i'm just always constantly focused on just achieving great things mm -hmm. didn't really have a moment to go wow this is what i created you know and this is why andressa always says to me you know celebrate sit, sit here yeah. and remember what you've done because you know that one person that first person who paid the hard-earned money mm. and bought your products that's yeah. a, that's where you got to celebrate. Yeah, and it's, then it's happening all over and over and over again. Maybe this is your lesson. Maybe it's not about changing the world. Maybe it's about you actually celebrating your small wins. Yeah, right. It's a journey, isn't it? Yeah, and I just, I just one of the biggest things I want to take away from from for anyone that was listening to this podcast 
is I've had to work extremely hard to be where I am. I've sacrificed a lot and I've been through a lot. And I just want people to know that when they listen to, to my story in particular, is that everything's possible as long as you work hard for it. No, we, 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 it's not necessarily how much money you throw at we, it. We're sound, surrounded by get rich quick schemes now. And it just doesn't, no one talks about the, the hard parts of business. You know, no one talks about how you get your shipments out of Dubai customs when it's been stuck there for three weeks because of paperwork here, there and everywhere. And moments of where you have to, you know, pay this type of bill and that type of bill. It's always like, oh, make your first 10K online, blah, blah, blah. But truly it's like so rewarding because I feel like I've, it's like, I feel like it's my first child, you know? Uh, and it, it's now starting to flourish. Um, and, you know, like I say, being able to talk to people that bought at the first, at the beginning, it was all friends and family, girlfriends and stuff like that. Like my girlfriend, not girlfriends, plural, but um, we'll keep that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Girlfriends. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But like <laughs> wives and buying it for their yeah, husbands yeah, and stuff like that. But, and then I remember this one email, because I get an email every time there's an order and it's a name that I didn't know. And I was like, wow, yeah, wow. And I actually personally took that parcel. So I went to meet her mm -hmm. uh, and I gave it to her and I was like, I really hope you guys enjoy and, and stuff like that. And yeah, just seeing all these random people order now. It's beautiful, it's, isn't it? It's just, yeah, it's so rewarding. Yeah, it's so, so yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, I'm just excited for the future. Just um, remember me when you're on the way up, you know, when you bypass me and, looking down waving I'll never, this. I'll never forget anyone that's that's been along in that journey do you know what I mean it's um you know I'm so thankful for everyone that I've been able to meet along the way even like even when we first met you know before before we'd even discussed this podcast I said to you like there's something here like I feel it you know um and even to this day you know and I've ne I'm not the type of person to to ever frivolous to say it yeah I yes. would just, I would and also I'd, regardless of where I am in 10 years, I will never forget the people around me because those, I, it's just not in my nature. I'm still Danny, like I, that, the, I suppose the little boy inside me is still here with good intentions and I would never do, forget anyone that's, that's, that's been there along the way, you mm -hmm. know? It, I th it they believes in you, believes yeah. in Danny. Exactly. You know, ultimately it's all about love, isn't it? It is, and we ultimately, said that. Ultimately it's about love. It is. It goes back to where we started. Yeah. Ultimately it's about love. People who drive the fast cars, have the fancy lifestyle, they all want acceptance and ultimately love. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I think you touch wood, you, you're blessed. This young lady, I'd love to meet her and she's come to you at the right time. Yeah. Uh, makes you really, really enjoy the journey because that's habitual, mm. right? Enjoying yourself or beating yourself up is habitual. You get used to that habit. Yeah. So start celebrating the journey because you're not going to get happy at the end. No, I know. I yeah, know. If you got used to kicking yourself, you're just going to get to the end, you're dead. Mm. What was all that about? Right? I know. So life's too short. Yeah, it's, um, no, it's, it's, I think I was thinking about this on the way here because having not been on a podcast before being interviewed, you kind of think to yourself, what, what do I say? And then when I thought about my life, I thought, wow, like, yeah, it gave me a moment to reflect and be like, you've achieved so, so much. So from where you've come 34, from. Mate. I was a dad of two at 34. Mm -hmm. But then I look back and I was a kid, I was a child, you know. So you've achieved so much in such a young age. But what I do want to do, though, I want to organize something just before summer for you and I, for me to interview you and then share nuggets in your business journey. Yeah. I, the audience have got to know you. Mm. And I, I'm sure they listen, they got inspired. What I want to do is that, like, give me nuggets yeah. in this entrepreneurial journey. The ups, the downs, the wins, the losses, the lessons, everything. Yeah, 100%. Man, I honor you. Thank you so much for Thank you so win. much. Thank you for your time, brother. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed it half as much as I did. And uh, thank you very much, Daniel. It's really you, appreciated. Yeah, loved it. Much respect. Thank you. See you next time.